position. You people with E90s, A100s, F90s, 200s, etc., your fuel panel is a lot different than this. You won't be turning on the cross-feed auto and the boost pumps. That's a lot better system than those later airplanes. Now we're about to give the right generator the biggest shock load it's ever going to get as it starts up this left engine from scratch. It's not really from scratch. That engine is slightly turning, about 5%, just due to ram air through the cowling. But nonetheless, I want to back off this temperature in the right engine so when that generator loads up, the temperature can rise and still not exceed any limits. So I'm going to come on back to about 900 foot-pounds of torque, put the temp in the mid-600 range. So now we're ready. We're going to turn on the left start switch. We'll look at the enunciator panel and verify that the left ignition light comes on. We'll wait for the speed to stabilize. We'll introduce the fuel just like for the ground start. The ignition light came on. The speed is stabilizing with the ram air plus the generator assisted start at about 26%. Fuel's coming in. I can see fuel flow because the inverter is on for the air start. I see a light off here. I see the temp. Exceedingly cool start because of the starter assist and the ram air. So the engine is started. Oil pressure is fine. Oil pressure is working since the inverter is on. So the start switch off. The generator switch comes on, which extinguishes the light. My loads and volts look normal. Now the engine is running, but it's still feathered. So we have about 59% low idle speed at this altitude. Nice low temp, but prop feathered. If we just slam the prop control forward and leave it there, it will unfeather, but with a lot of surging as it comes up in the governor's speed. So try this technique. Pull forward until we see the rise, back to the minimum possible speed, and then maintain positive torque. Move this throttle up about one knob behind the other. That way it comes out with a minor amount of surging. It grabbed the governor at the lowest governor speed. Now let's match up our props at 1900. Let's go ahead and match up our torques at a fairly low value, maybe about 500 foot-pounds. Let's take out that rudder trim. Cleared to three at my discretion, four, eight, November. Fuel control heat switch back on. And cabin temp mode back. The environmental panel is all set where we want. And a final scan around the entire cockpit, just making sure we didn't overlook anything. Certainly the oil temperature is a bit cooler in that engine than the other because it's just got restarted. But everything looks absolutely normal. Down to 3,000 heading 180. Okay, the ILS identified. The course is 323 degrees. Got the nav displayed on the HSI. The VOR here is frequency 108, but it's off the air today as well as the DME. I'm going to go ahead and put the GPS on the airport and overlay the approach plate here, the inbound course for 323 degrees. And that way we should be able to have a picture here which basically shows us the extended center line of the ILS. So our distance to the airport, the center of the airport, will be coming from GPS here. Uh, the requirement is, is not to have the VOR, NDB, or correction, say DME for this approach. So we're legal with that VOR off the air. However, the best approach is a climb to 29 direct to the VOR. We'll be having to get alternate instructions from the controller for vectors or use the GPS for that. 300 feet to go. 140 Quebec, turn left heading 140. 140, Quebec. Turn the air conditioning back on. Get ready to level out. Altitude hold engaged. Gotta come up here to try to hold the speed about 160 for now. So we've discovered that slightly below 800 foot pounds.
Okay, the weather, we're pretending it's minimums, but doable for the approach. The radios have been tuned and identified. Let's turn the radar back on here to say we did. The ATIS, 25-3. See what the latest word there is. And still tower information at Sierra 1554 Zulu weather. Wind 150 at 5, visibility 6, haze. Sky conditions, scattered clouds, 9,000. Temperature 20, 2.16, altimeter 290. ILS from my 32, circle runway 14, and use to burning runway 14. Nose down and Mansfield Vortec out of service. Boston Air Met Sierra Tango Zulu are valid for further information. Monitor High Walser Contact Flight Service. Advise on this contact you have information, Sierra. All right, we got Sierra, and they said the wind was light enough that they're kind of be offering us the straight in landing on runway 32. Four, two, back, turn left, heading zero, five, zero. Zero, five, zero, four, two, back. The minimums in this are 1493. I'm going to set this here as a reminder, about 1500 feet. The hill elevation is 1297, touchdown zone 1293. Cessna 3 Hotel Pop, crossing traffic 1230, 3 miles east southeast bound, 2600 indicated. Altitudes are considered and Looking appropriate. Traffic, three hotel pop. Just going to set this up out of the way now. Go back at 6 miles from Mans, turn left heading 350, maintain 3000, both savage on localizer, cleared ILS runway 32 approach. Left turn and 3000 till established, 4 to Quebec, clear for the approach. Yeah, hit the approach three button for the flight director autopilot system. Tracking I'm going to come back to my middle power setting, about 500, and go to the first notch of flaps, approach flaps. My target speed on the approach from out of marker inbound will be 120 knots. 3 HP, traffic's 12 o'clock, one mile. Great help up, Roger, uh, still looking, uh, traffic not uh, in sight here. Roger. Let's see, our descent checklist is done, except pressurization is still catching up. And before landing, cabin sign switch coming to both. HP, your Flaps are approach. Landing gear is next, and we'll get that by the time we capture the glide slope. We just capture the localizer. Let's see. Marker audio. Yes. Contact tower one one nine or point eight. Tower nineteen eight four two Quebec. That's what tower King Air nine four four two Quebec is with the outside the outer marker for a full stop three two. King Air four two Quebec man still tower runway three two clear to land wind six zero at six. Clear to land. Glide slope is alive. Now, if it were still fast, I'd drop the gear as a speed brake. But since we're pretty close to our speed, I'll just put the gear down almost as the glide slope centers right now. Verifying three green, no red. Sink off. Three light switches on. And again, let's just our weight start with about 450 foot pounds of torque. See how it looks. Notice I'm doing lots of tweaking of rudder. As the gear comes down, there's almost always a need to change. I'm a bit fast, which may be due to the tailwind on this approach, so I'm going to try about 350 torque for a while. Let's continue the before landing checklist. There's the marker. As the backup, I'll start the time, and the altitude cross checks nicely. Pop six switch off. The pressurization is down to half a pound. The cabin temp mode selector in this model, I'll choose to turn off now and eliminate the air conditioning. The last items are flaps, yaw damper, and prop levers forward at touchdown. A thousand feet to the airport. The power setting seems to be working, bringing the speed back. Let's try even a little bit less power. Now I will simulate that we're only going to break out and see the runway right near the minimums of the 1,500 feet. When we're that close, and the runway is as long as it is here, 9,000 feet, the recommendation is to just land with the flap setting you have. And at our weight, 
that over the fence landing number speed should probably be about 98 knots or so even with approach flaps. So I'll put this here as a minor reminder. And so I have that last 20 knots or so to bleed off at the end. The autopilot's working to fly the approach. I'm monitoring. Speed's a bit low, but at this point I'm not worried to make a change just yet. Still within a five or 10 knot area of target speed. 200 feet to go to minimums. One hundred feet to go to minimums. Pretend we're breaking out. Runway's in sight. We'll turn off the autopilot yacht amper. Continue to use the flight director bars. And reducing power to try to target that speed. Try not to duck under. Just try to follow the glide path right to the threshold. And it looks like we got it. Power to idle. Not working too hard. Letting it land here on the center on the touchdown point. Props forward and back into beta to slow down. Slowing down 80 knots, 60 knots. If I were in reverse, I'd start coming out now, so I'd be out by 40. But I'm just in the flat pitch position. You know, this is split and prop RPM. That's a typical problem sometimes with minor variation rigging. And as I bring the power levers back forward a bit, that'll come more together. Air four two, go back to the left, turn to next uh, intersection, man, this frequency, and uh, say your intentions. Now, the after landing flow pattern is basically the reverse of runway lineup. The runway lineup is right to left. Now we're going left to right. The auto ignition is off. The ice protection switches are off. The lights, the trim, flaps, radar, transponder, bleed air. And mode selector is off. In this model, the temperatures have to be below 610 degrees for the last minute before shutdown. And with the temperature outside and the load reduced, they are, even though we have low idle set in the condition levers. So now that I think I've done the check right, I've kind of got a breathing spell going straight. I'll look at the checklist and see if we did, in fact, get all those items done. Yeah, it looks good. So after landing checklist complete. To retain the, the voice portion of the video, I will not be turning off the avionics master shut down at the proper time. I'll, I'll tell you when I'd be doing that. So I'm going to turn off the radios here individually to save them from a bit of a voltage spike as we shut down. With low idle selected, because I've reduced the air conditioning load and the temperature outside being uh, no more than 20 degrees, the airplane has not required quite as much beta to control taxi speed. And we'll come in here beside this pretty Falcon 10 or Falcon 100. Over the gate for a little momentum around the turn, but without adding power so I don't spike my engine temperatures. If I elevate those, I should wait another minute before I shut down. So proper planning for the taxi portion. Again, we'll go through the shutdown checklist now as a do list, so you can see exactly what's involved with this. Park and brake as desired. I have set it here to use while I finish the checklist. Transfer pumps on the fuel panel are off. The crossfeed switch over there is to the closed position. The avionics master would come off now. We'd kill all the radio, including the intercom. The inverter switch off. The fuel control heat switch is off. The bar switch is off. The cabin sign switch off. The vent blower is now auto. Remember, the mode selector was off before, so that completes turning off the environmental controls. ITT check that has been stabilized below 610 in this aircraft for one minute. Friction locks a bit loosened, ready to move the levers back. Power levers confirmed at idle, not back in beta or reverse where we can damage when we feather props. Now, condition levers cut off. Left to the left, right to the right. When the props get to about 600, if you feather them, they go in quite smoothly with no big torque increase, no vibration in the airplane. Props feather. Lights are off. I'll leave the strobe on, the beacon on here, just as a matter of course. The, this particular airplane has had the rotating beacon replaced with a strobe. It's the, the beacon switch. Uh, voltmeters. Uh, 
for November With the battery is the only source of power, we still have voltage, which is verification we did not blow any current level during the start or the flight. Boost pumps Boost now come off below 10%. Thank you. Control locks, we'll put those in just in case Roger. the wind comes up when we're out of the airplane. And the very last step is to release the parking brake. Once we get a chalk in, though, we're not going to roll. That's the shutdown. Talk to you later. We're sitting again uh, near the end of Runway 9 at Darby Dan Airport in Columbus. And uh, occasionally, you'll find yourself in a position where we need to make a quick, tight turn uh, from a standing start, getting out maybe of a, of a position of parking that, that wasn't the best choice in the world or another airplane had moved in close to us. Rather than splitting the throttles and adding a lot of throttle on the outboard engine, a technique that seems to work uh, perhaps even better in a King Air is this one. I'm holding the brakes. I'm taking both condition levers smoothly and gently up to the high idle position. Now, if we do that too rapidly, especially on a hot day with the air conditioning running and a high load in the engines, that can cause a significant spike of the ITTs. But bring it up slow like that, we have that power setting. Now, also, knowing that high idle is never a power setting that would cause too much torque or temp, I could virtually do that while my attention was still outside looking uh, for this tight area I have to turn in. Now, I'm going to release my, my feet off the rudder pedal brakes let the airplane roll forward maybe three, four, or five feet. And then I'll put in full left rudder pedal to plate displacement and left brake. And the airplane will almost pivot around this left tire to make the turn from the standing start. Here we go. Once we have some momentum going, now I can bring the condition levers back and just let the airplane coast around the rest of the way. Let's do it to the other direction and get positioned right near the end of the runway. High idle, slight forward travel rudder, brake, and I'm going to let the airplane coast down here right to the very, very end of the runway because of the fact we're simulating now a short field takeoff. So what's that old line about the, the runway behind us is useless on a short field? Another technique which not only works for the King Air, but most other airplanes with conventionally rotating propellers, propellers that rotate to the clockwise position as viewed from the cockpit, is that as we line up, I'll be near the center line, but cocked slightly to the right, because by holding the brakes and setting full power, there will be a nor very noticeable tendency for the airplane to swerve to the left as I release the brakes. And by aiming slightly to the right, I should be able to counter that with rudder input and remain off the brakes. Of course, any brake use would tend to increase the takeoff roll. <coughs> We've completed the before takeoff checklist. We're up to the runway lineup flow, right to left. The cabin temperature mode selector is in the off position. The vent blower is low. The transponder, radar coming on, the lights. <coughs> we have a little rain in the area. I think I'll use the pitot heat for ice protection. Don't need the auto ignition. I think we're ready to go. Now, <coughs> for the short field of space in a hot day, taking off with bleeder off, the mode selector in the off position guarantees we've reduced the loads in the engine to the point that we can probably get as much power as possible with a minimum of ITT. Coming up, holding the brakes. <coughs> There, I've reached the 700 degree training limit, and let's go. A little bit of a friction adjustment here so the left throttle doesn't slip. And the airplane swings right back to the center line. <coughs> right rudder, keep it straight. Looking for 97 knots in this aircraft as the takeoff speed. Here we go. Positive rate. The gear comes up. The landing taxi lights are off. Monitoring temperatures, torques, doing nothing else for the first 400 feet. There we are. Confirming flaps are up. The on amp are on. Starting my turn onto the crosswind leg, reducing power. Since I'm climbing only to the traffic pattern altitude, if I can get there via VFR today, I'll be bringing the props all the way back to cruise RPM instead of stopping at the typical 2,000 RPM for climb. In all 90 series King Airs, with the exception of the F90, no charts exist for approach flaps on takeoff. 
So even the short fill takeoff, done in a safe manner, would be done flaps up. On the other hand, some King Airs do use flaps for takeoff, and they're the ones who can use the flaps for the benefit of reducing stall speed, and yet still be able to rotate at a speed above VMC. Now, there's no question at all that if VMC was not a concern, by using approach flaps to lower stall speed, we could be rotating and climbing out at, at 80 knots or less, and certainly use a lot, lot less runway. But the problem is, if we lose an engine, we're in a world of hurt at that time, with the only option being to, of course, pull power back the remaining engine and land straight ahead. So as long as we are going to use a speed above VMC in a C90, E90 type King Air, there's no advantage using the flaps. As I level off at 1,500 feet AGL, selecting flaps to approach, and for the short field landing, and we do have a bit of scud around here, might have to fly my next pattern a bit lower, I've put high on the condition levers, so I have less delay time spooling up the engines into full reverse. Gears down, lights are on, sinks off, beginning the descent. High idle makes no difference at this time. As you can see, the engines are the same with the condition levers forward or back. The difference shows up in the fact there'll be less spool up time to get full reverse established. On the other hand, there will be a tendency for the airplane to float slightly, so we must make sure that our speed is under control properly and that we don't try for too much smoothness on this landing. We simply let the airplane land and allow us to establish full reverse. Another difference on the short fill landing <coughs> is to use propeller levers full forward as an extra drag item. This not only helps us slow down and create the proper speed over the fence, but it also means we'll have one less thing to do at touchdown, simply keeping our hand on the power levers and able to lift up and go into full reverse the moment of touchdown. We're going to select flap 60. Most King Airs have the ability to select flaps anywhere from the approach position to the full down position. From about 1993 onward, those King Airs do not have that selectability for flaps, only three position flaps. Turning final, the flaps are down, <coughs> the landing checklist is complete except for the propellers up, the yaw damper off, and now I'm increasing the propellers to the full forward position. Verifying condition levers are up. I've now turned off the yaw damper by clicking my disconnect button on the control yoke. <coughs> at our weight, the normal landing speed would be about 93 knots. And for the short field at the very end, I'll be getting Delaware, even below that. I don't want to drag it in low and slow. I want to be in position, always handle an unexpected engine failure. But certainly once the runway is truly made, <coughs> the last bit of speed on final will be quite low, knowing that the high idle provides a nice cushion for the landing. I'll be attempting to touch down just where we see the, the threshold marking of the runway, maybe about uh, 200 feet past the, the end of the runway here. I think I have it made. The throttles are closed. A very, very slight arresting of the sink rate and letting it land. And now full reverse. On the brakes now as we slow up, 60 knots beginning to come out of reverse so that the, by the time we're at 40 knots, we're back into the beta range. And now the condition levers can get reduced to the desired idle speed based on the conditions of the day. And it's cool enough now, I'll just come on back to low idle. On the next demonstration, I'll be simulating an engine failure as the instructor and also as the pilot flying now. That's kind of a no-brainer since I'm giving the failure to myself. I'll know what to expect. In a training scenario, you'll see me bring the condition levers to high idle as I begin the takeoff roll. That's to help get closer to a zero thrust setting fairly rapidly and also give me more quick response to the engines uh, if some unsuspected problem should develop, like an engine failure of the other engine after I pull back one, and where I want to get the the first engine working again quite rapidly. And uh, I will be doing this just right after rotation, just very close to 97 knots, which is the minimum speed in this model where continued takeoff would be practical. 
And certainly we need to know the airplane well enough and check the charts to decide if we have any single engine going capability at all. There can be combinations of weights and temperatures where certainly this maneuver is not possible to have to land straight ahead. But today at our weight, the power available, the going with the single engine situation is going to be quite easy. After I do that, I'll climb out the first uh, thousand feet or so single engine. I'll be calling Columbus Approach and asking for a uh, uh, IFR clearance over to Rickenbacker Airport for some approaches. Let us see that news. Okay, runway lineup, right to left. Condition number's coming up as a training technique. Darby Dan, King Airport to Quebec, departing runway nine. And away we go. On the governors. Power is set. Temps coming up on 700. Coming back to the center line. And rotate. And a power loss. And power's good. Props. Positive rate. Gear up. I'm pushing a lot of left foot now. I think the right foot is dead. Check my engine instruments. Right is dead. Throttle is verified. Prop is feathered. And for zero thrust, we're going to set 1800 RPM. And now bring the condition lever slightly back to about 65% setting, which for this model is the zero thrust setting. Bit of rudder trim to help me out and start my left turn. Two emergency procedures which are often confused one for the other both involve the presence of smoke in the cabin and cockpit. One, electrical smoke or fire, and the second, environmental smoke and fumes. In both cases, we begin by turning the cabin temp mode selector on the co-pilot's left sub-panel to the off position. But now, if the smoke has a gray or a tan color to it, and the smell and, and is irritating to our nose and bad for the eyes, now we guess it's probably electrical in nature. And we take the vent blower switch down to the automatic position if it were not already there. The FAA service difficulty report file indicates that the leading cause of smoke in King Airs has been the vent blower motor burning up, which makes sense. It's the only big electrical motor that's inside the pressure vessel with us and virtually running all the time. So by mode selector off and vent blower at auto, there's a good chance we've solved the problem by turning off the, the vent blower. On the other hand, if the smoke is a lighter color, does not have a bad smell, is not irritating to the nose and eyes, perhaps it smells a bit hot or oily, now the source is probably the aircraft's bleed air. The bleed air got too hot, or an engine developed an oil leak in a position that allowed the oil to get to the bleed air system. So now, after the mode selector is off, the vent blower goes to high to circulate more cabin air through the ductwork and try to dilute this bad air that's coming in. Well, that may be a delaying tactic, but it's not really a solution. The solution lies in turning off the bleed air. And certainly, if we were at an altitude where precision was not necessary, turning off both bleed air switches might make all the sense in the world. But in an attempt to handle the problem and maintain precision, now the procedure calls for the left bleed air switch to go to the closed position. Why the left? Why not the right? Well, remember that for bleed air heating, the left side must get fully hot before the right side heats at all. And so if both sides are not in the full hot position, we're killing more of the heat, which may be the source of the problem, by turning off the left instead of the right. The last comment, in early King Air such as this one, the crew oxygen masks are the same as the passengers. Loose fitting rebreather bags that don't do a good job of eliminating uh, smoke. We cannot select 100% oxygen feeding our face. So, after we've done these steps, now think about the oxygen. On the other hand, in King Airs that do have good, tight-fitting, demand-type crew masks, which are F90s and the 200-300 series, certainly it's always best to start by taking care of your own physiological needs and put on the oxygen mask first before we start into the flow pattern beginning with the Copilot's left sub-panel. So mode selector off, vent blower off if it's electrical, mode selector off, that lower high, left leader off with environmental. 
Now go to the checklist and continue from that point to do the non-memory items. We're now being radar vectored by Columbus approach at 3,000 feet, uh, approaching a left downwind for the ILS runway 23 left approach at Rickenbacker International Airport in Columbus, Ohio. I have tuned and identified NAV 1, 110.1 for the ILS, set the inbound course at 230 degrees. There's really no VOR in the nearby vicinity. Number two VOR is on Appleton. It's been tuned and identified. The DME has also been identified as coming from Appleton. Uh, but that's almost 20 miles uh, northeast of the Outer Compass locator, even more away from the airport here at Rickenbacker. Marker Beacon audio has been turned on. The minimum for this approach, uh, decision altitude at 940, I'm setting that on my altimeter bug as a reminder. The missed approach instructions, rather than the published mist, have been modified by Columbus Approach as a left turn heading 135 degrees and 3,000 feet for the missed approach. On this particular King Air, the number two needle, the double needle on the RMI, always points at NAV2. So the head is pointing to Apple and VOR. The tail consequently becomes our radial from. So for orientation purposes, we're now on about the 205 degree radial, 19 miles away from Apple and VOR. The single needle always points to the ADF. And there is a outer compass locator at the outer marker here, pickle intersection. 376. We've tuned that and identified it on the uh, ADF. Senior 42 Quebec, turn left heading 310. 310, 42 Quebec. It appears like we're turning on to a base leg. We're about uh, slightly east southeast, about the 110 degree bearing from the outer compass locator. When we get on the 50 degree bearing from it, we'll be on course. I'm starting to slow down a bit now, anticipation of the approach. Coming back to the, the magic number to start with of about 400, or correction, 500 foot pounds at our weight, slightly below that. The descent check has been completed. Now, somewhere before we get uh, much inside the outer marker, I'll be again pulling back the right power lever to simulate the failure of the right engine. I'm proceeding with our normal engine failure procedure, continuing this as a single engine ILS. because I anticipate that this is a vector to eventually intercept. I'll reach down to the autopilot flight director control panel, hit the approach button. The enunciator says we're flying heading, the approach mode is armed, we're holding altitude, the flight director is on, the autopilot's engaged. Our speed is bleeding down nicely. Tails always rise. That phrase applied to an RMI means the tails always move upwards. So right now I'm on the 210 radial of Appleton. If I continue this heading, I'll get to the 215, the 220. And actually, Here according to the chart, you back. You're five miles from Pickle. Turn left, heading 260. Maintain 2,500 till established on the localizer. Cleared our last runway. 23 left, side step to 23 red approach. Roger, 260 down to 2.5 to intercept. Clear for the approach. 42 to go back and side step. So as this moves up, when it gets to about 221 within the accuracy of a VOR that's 20-some miles away at that point, we'll be at the outer compass locator. In King Air 42 Quebec, the glide slope is out of service for uh, the ILS to see through left. So we observed that. Just going to ask you about that, 42 Quebec. Well, that kind of messes up our plans a bit here, but in real life we have to be flexible, so uh, we're going to be flexible here. And basically with that, this becomes a non-precision approach. Once we're established, the altitude at the uh, outer marker will be 2,400 feet. And the MDA for this sidestep is 1140. And also with the glides about, this has changed from a precision to a non-precision approach. And since we're going to be doing it single engine, the me method in which we'll be putting the gear down is a bit different. Waiting until we have the the runway in sight. King Air 42 Quebec, contact Rick Tower 120.05. 20.05, 42 Quebec. Rick Tower, King Air 9442 Quebec is two outside the uh, outer compass locator. 
Anthony would like a stop and go if traffic permits. Front of Rick Tower, say again. Yeah, it's King Air, 944 to Quebec, just outside the outer, requesting stop and go if your traffic permits. 944 to Quebec, side step 23 right, wind 130 at 6, runway 23 right, cleared stop and go. Side step to the right and cleared stop and go on the right, 4 to Quebec. Uh oh, I think there's an engine problem. Both power levers doubling it, but I'm only working with one since we're training. Props up. Flaps are at approach. I'm choosing to leave it that.